Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Frith Williams Aho. My name's Frith, um, and I pretty much oversee uh, the creative team here at Te Papa across uh, exhibition and web channels. Uh, ngā mihi nui mo tō wā i tēnei rā. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this was Te Papa's opening 21 years ago. It's almost a group hug around the entire building, and it really uh, shows the sea change at the time which was appealing to a much broader and more diverse audience than ever before. So when it came to redeveloping um, our permanent galleries for the first time, since then we were conscious of the big shoes we had to fill and the really, really high expectations. Uh, but our amazing team have risen to the challenge. Toy Art opened in March 2018 and Te Taiao Nature, which is my focus today in May this year. So uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the foundations we put in place for that redevelopment, the interpretive principles we set from an audience creative point of view, with some examples of how they manifest in the show, and some key things that we learned. Now I'm not starting from medium, from digital, analogue, face-to-face, because we didn't and shouldn't start there. Uh, but you will see where digital solutions were used because they supported those audience principles in ways that other media couldn't and added huge value. So where did we begin? Uh, the museum as a whole set a new mission, changing hearts, minds and lives. And that really reflected much more comfort in taking a stand, uh, particularly in relation to environmental sustainability where the science is pretty clear. We set an overall renewal approach. So this is really the type of experience that we were aiming to create in a nutshell, uh, and very much informed by technological, social, and environmental trends. So Inspire Wonder recognizes that in this digital age, uh, information available anywhere, anytime, by anyone, our role shifts towards being a place of inspiration. Though also still accuracy, particularly with Trump's alternative realities. Uh, nurturing diversity, that recognises our diversifying society in Te Moana Nui Akiwa uh, and the need to represent those many perspectives. Shake things up, uh, the need to acknowledge the big environmental and social challenges of our time. And related to that, prepare for the future. To be relevant, we need to look forward because history is happening now. Invite involvement. In this age of social media, the experience economy, people desire participation. Reach out. We need to go where our people are, online and on the street, as much as here, and empower our communities. Uh, everything we do is about serving our communities. So who are they? Our audiences. We broadened our understanding of our audience beyond our demographics and took on MHM's psychographic segments. Now, segments are a bit like personas. Don't assume that every Māori person, every millennial, every middle-aged woman like me uh, is the same or wants the same. They classify audiences by their motivations in relation to arts and culture, the type of experience they're seeking, and are used by an increasing number of museums worldwide, so they're aiding benchmarking in that sense. So I've shown our priority audiences, expression, stimulation, and affirmation. And you'll see uh, they're on the right here, so they're already our biggest audiences. And they're quite aligned in many ways in what they're looking for, particularly social opportunities, fun, interactivity, immersion, and that helps to create a cohesive experience. In many museums, you'll see essence higher. They're the more sophisticated, uh, independent, educated audience, still very important for us too, particularly in our art galleries. Less of a target elsewhere, in part because they'll come anyway. And supporting the need for a social experience is this, that our audiences are primarily social. 80% uh, come with others, and of those, 20% are families. In fact, that figure's risen to 25% since Te Taiao opened. And we still do identify families as a social target, a demographic of sorts, because their shared needs aren't fully captured by the culture seg segments. And they're also really, really important repeat visitors, and we are wanting to increase local repeat visitation. And in addition, we highlight young Māori and Pacific visitors. They are the future of cultural re revitalisation, and this particularly has to do with content, so ensuring their stories and their voices are heard. 
So these are the interpretive principles we set to meet the needs of those audiences and also to capture best practice in storytelling, number one is very relevant there, and learning theory, number four is particularly relevant, I'll come to that. So these principles essentially guided the sorts of experience we would invest in, again both digital and physical because the medium came afterwards, but clearly we needed to go beyond text and graphics. And we do have other more fundamental principles too. Now they're in this list because they should never be debated. So they're more permanent and more important in that sense, particularly by culturalism. In Te Taia, we wanted mātauranga Māori knowledge to be absolutely central, not just positioned over there as myth, but as a vital way of understanding our natural world based on years of observation and key to guiding our relationship to it. Um, knowledge that both differs from and aligns with science in different areas. So very briefly on the concept, obviously an enormous amount of work uh, went into this, involving our collections and scholarship around them, our evaluations of past exhibitions, our entire project team went out and spoke to the hosts, observed visitors on the floor, and there was a lot of academic research into New Zealanders' environmental attitudes that we looked at, as well as the psychology of behaviour change, because that's the impact we were seeking change. We did formative testing of the early concepts <coughs> with diverse groups right around the country in five centres and you can see how they voiced a really strong desire for a positive uplifting take on environmental issues not a didactic depressing to-do list. Um, I'm going to take you through these principles and show you examples of how we applied them to the concept. The first principle is to be targeted, less is more. Now this is an age old principle of storytelling but I think even more uh, valid today because of how we're inundated with information. Museums have a really bad habit of trying to do far too much to the point where um, it's very unclear what to take away. So my number one concern throughout was that, um, that's beige, <laughs> it's meant to be, it's trying to please everyone, it's not very memorable and really everything that we do is about memorability because it supports learning. So we counted that risk in part by being very targeted in our big ideas, which everything in Te Taio comes back to. Taonga are the very specific characteristics that make our natural world unique from anywhere else in the world. Tokotokorangi, the most important threats we're facing today, and kaitiakitanga the positive actions that people are taking in those areas to protect the natural world. And two really important underlying ideas are Modi and Fanongatanga, which I'll come to really soon. And the overall plan actually shows those big ideas because they form the structure uh, from bottom left, uh, uniqueness in the green, te ika whenua, unique NZ, through threat, the circle in the middle, te kohanga, the nest, and on to action, ngā kaitiaki guardians in the blue, and the second principle is emotion, which is also key to storytelling. It helps make stories sticky, if you like, memorable. And as it turns out, it's also essential, essential to inspiring behaviour change, as environmental psychology uh, tells us. How do you get people to protect the environment? By helping them care first. And so the phrase that guided us throughout was from connection to action. And that all came back to the impact we were wanting to have, connection first, awareness of the issues, and then action. Again, that formed the structure of the show. And there's also a connection to why we chose Maui as the narrator, as our sort of welcomer and guide. Because he's relatable, we can connect with him emotionally. He's an explorer, but he's also, he also pushes too far, he exploits. Um, he's also a shapeshifter, so he's got huge potential for problem solving and innovation. Essentially, Maui is us, and we are Maui in the show. Uh, he brings a sense of character, he sets the slightly cheeky tone, and he also sets our challenge at the start. Uh, and you can see here too the approach to bilingual content, where we intersperse the Maori into the English, as well as have it separately, and that's to encourage language learning, which is a really, really big emphasis for us now. Maui appears in various places throughout, in digital and analogue form. He's teasing, he's encouraging contributions, he's prompting reflection. 
including at the end where he pops up in a projected montage of New Zealanders taking action and challenges us to do the same. And that sense of emotion, character, extends right through Unique NZ uh, and how we present our species. Kind of like eccentric family members, the odd bunch, thieving weka, peculiar parrot, croakless frogs. Uh, so that's all about supporting this idea of whanaungatanga, the idea that we are connected to the natural world. We really feel that. Third principle, social. Um, so as mentioned, our target audiences are looking to do things together. So we nurture that, especially where doing so supports the concept. And digital technologies really come to the fore here, especially in relation to scale. Uh, the Modi activator uh, in the first gallery introduces the concept of Modi, life force, abundance. Why make it social? In part because it's such an important concept, but also because nurturing abundance uh, means working together. So it's part of the concept. And here you place your hands, I hope you get to do this, on a, a beautiful carved interface um, to activate the Modi. It appears in the form of wildlife and energy on these very large, this very large screen above. The more hands, the more abundant and dynamic that life becomes. Why digital and audiovisual for the payoff? Um, because it is so great at representing something that's otherwise hard to see. Energy and abundance in, in quite a magical way. With experiences that depend on social interaction for success, I think it's really important to remember um, that spectatorship is as important as participation for learning, as you see here. So it's not a failure for visitors to watch. That said, testing very important, uh, especially to ensure that the payoff for that social interaction and collaboration is great enough. And here's testing of the Modi Activator a month or two before opening. It's another example um, of the social principle, whānaungatanga. Ko au te taiao, ko te taiao ko au. I am nature, nature is me, everything's connected. And here a gesture-based camera picks up your body and sort of shows your silhouette embedded with natural imagery. It's another beautiful illustration of that magical quality that digital media can bring. Um, and that's why we chose it after brainstorming, God, must have been about, you know, 100 other possibilities. This went through multiple iterations before we came to something really quite simple. Uh, and again, it's the fact that people do this together that's particularly powerful. They dance, they jump around, they laugh, and that's the, the sort of joyous connection that we wanted to encourage. Um, social interaction, of course, doesn't have to be digital or complex or costly. Uh, this is quite a cheap interactive. It's a set of industrial scales that allow you to weigh in against the 240 kg giant moa. So these kids together don't even get close. They weigh a little bit more than a stout-legged moa. There's lots of laughter with this one. Um, and supporting social interaction can be as simple as making something big enough for people to gather around, like this endemic case, making a table big enough for various people to draw on, or a screen big enough for them to gather around. That's really, really key. Uh, even displaying an image from a microscope on a wall monitor uh, so mum and dad can enjoy it with their child. Fourth principle is physical, uh, which is closely connected to social. Now this is, is about the value of play, but it's not just about being hands-on and pushing buttons for the sake of it. I'm really talking about embodied learning. Uh, where the physical action that we're asking for matches the concept, the real action. Um, so much of our learning happens in our bodies, so this can really increase long-term retention of knowledge. And of course, digital can support the physical, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, here, the story of New Zealand's formation, uh, which explains why our wildlife evolved to be so weird and unique. Uh, in our old galleries, we told the story of Zealandia on a monitor on the wall. This time we chose to project it on the floor so that people, especially kids, could follow the land masses with their bodies um, to help understand that notion of geographical isolation. So it's a very fun and simple form of physicality. Here you can see us testing it by lying on the floor <laughs> to get a sense of looking down uh, at the land masses. We also brought back an old favourite, some of you may know this, the Earthquake House, uh, but we revamped the experience inside. 
So you're invited to drop cover hold and you're taking the lead of your new neighbours who are through that door to your right. Um, so again, embodiment of a learning concept. Digital media has also evolved because involved because that doorway is of course a screen. We tested this pretty early on too with kids, as you can see here, lots of fun testing. Um, there are simpler examples of physicality too, no digital technology involved, pure touch, touching replica kiwi claws, even smelling the kiwi, um, that's a, a really popular one. And those senses are also vital because of course our audiences bring many different abilities and disabilities and this wonderful group of people with disabilities advised us on their needs and we adjusted our ideas as a result. Uh, for example in the Modi activator uh, we included sound and haptic feedback as part of the payoff for interaction. And the nature of that touch was important too, it needed to be nurturing, not frantic. Uh, physicality and interactivity are coming through really strongly in visitor research, um, so many confirm it as a driver for memorability and learning. It's a really nice expression of learning theory right there by one of our visitors. Unforgettable. Um, the senses, of course, have a strong connection to the fifth principle, immersion, taking people on a journey. So each space in Te Taiao is to some degree immersive. After Unique NZ, which is a, a bit like a forest clearing, Whakarua um, Moko, active land, is more like going underground. And that large scale projection um, at the back shows the eruption that created Lake Taupo, our super volcano. So scale, often really important in building immersion, of course. But the epitome of immersion is te kōhanga, the nest at the very heart of the space. Uh, it's the emotional turning point uh, from uniqueness and wonder through to threat. And here birdsong draws you in, sound. You find yourself in a beautiful forest with stunning images of birds all around you, <coughs> but which are thriving, threatened, or extinct, and by touching eggs you discover their status, you also trigger their calls if they're still around and build the soundscape. Uh, overall one in five of our birds are extinct and many others are endangered, so it's a very sobering moment. And now this experience is simpler than you might think, uh, it's made of recycled materials, it isn't digital or, sc or screen based, it's backlit labels with light and sound triggers. But it's still radically different from how we approached the same topic 10 years ago, uh, which is a pretty didactic graphic list of extinct species. So no immersion, no audience participation, no physicality, no senses. I'll leave you to decide which is more effective in terms of memorability and learning. This is actually still on level three in Blood Earth Fire. And once again, we tested very early prototypes of the nest in a local school as seen here. You're originally gonna touch skulls, bird skulls, kids, quickly told us that they didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, we tested even small things like the placement of graphics to uh, gauge point size and message. Um, if you look closely, my hand on the right has the word digi labels on it. That's my sustainable to-do list. And you'll hear more about those labels uh, from the team or over the back at midday. Uh, principle six, empowerment. So the questions posed in the nest are connected to empowerment. Asking questions is a learning strategy. It's also key to the scientific uh, process of inquiry. But we took that even further with te o, the current, and here we ask for your response to big environmental questions. And you can place yourself along a spectrum, from excited to angry, for example. You can express a more in-depth opinion in writing. Your views projected in real time in the gallery, and you can see it relative to others. So most museums display research, here we're wanting to contribute to it. So it's, it's really an experiment and we chose to create this digitally to support that research. We can upload those responses to a public database and track and analyse attitudes over time. And anyone can access that data, there's even potential to contribute to government policy here. So digital media really brings massive value in that way. And this experience is also available on our website, um, so reaching people where they are Big ups to Amos, who's over the back here, who managed that project. Um, empowerment can be, though, as simple as seeing yourself in the gallery, transformed in some way. Interesting to see a uh, kind of renewed desire for this retro analog uh, options like this. Like, who needs Snapchat when you've got a real mask? 
I mentioned digital labels. Uh, we use these for large displays of objects. So they bring specimens to life through audio and video. They're about presenting content fully bilingually without overwhelming you with text on the walls. And they're also about empowering you to choose what you want to find out about. And we can and do gather analytics on what you choose. Okay, the last principle. How's my time, by the way? Ooh, I'm going to have to go fast. Um, so it goes without saying that real things are fundamental to a museum's point of difference, and we should never forget that. Our collections are at the core of what we do. We can use digital labels to illuminate them, but the collections and their stories are the gold. Colossal Squid, one of our heroes. Who doesn't want to see the real giant wetter? Freaky deep sea fish, where else can you get to see them? So why would I include this immersive projection under the category of real? Uh, it's the climate converter. Here your goal is to create a carbon zero New Zealand and keep sea level rise and drought at bay. You have to raise your hand, that's a physical metaphor right there, to trigger community solutions around the walls. Uh, less dairy, more windmills, etc. And the environment around you changes the more action you take until you win and reach carbon zero. And again, you need to work together to do that. Uh, so it is social, it's physical, it's immersive, it's empowering, it's all those principles that I've talked about in one. But the reason it's also real isn't just because climate change is a very real and important issue, but because of what those girls on the bottom right are about to do. And that is make a personal pledge to combat climate change. Anything from I'll walk one day more to school each week to I'll eat a little less meat. And that pledge shape shifts into a bird like Maui, and joins the Kofi tree. And you can also opt in to an email which offers you advice to put your pledge into action. So that's the key real world connection. Uh, there's a link to our action AVs here too. Now these are 16 videos that show New Zealanders from all walks of life taking real action in real places around the country, like the school in Porirua cleaning up their local stream. These are crowdsourced videos, the community has filled, filmed them themselves. So it's about using those success stories to help inspire other further action. That URL at the top links you to a volunteering website called Collaborate, uh, which connects you to conservation opportunities where you live. Um, so again, real world connection. Now we know that only a few people access that URL in the exhibition. One person per day did over the first month. But of those 30 people, 40%, that's 12 people, actually signed up to volunteer. So that's pretty cool. Which brings me to our impact. We are capturing our success along the spectrum, uh, audience impact model. So it shifts from a basic level engagement on the left, uh, attention, right through to personal action, uh, community impact and national impact on the right. The simple fact-based learning in the middle. Um, so visitor numbers, long-standing success measure are actually on the left, attention. They're not the be all and end all, but they are still important. And on that note, we're 30% above visitation targets, which is cool. Um, and satisfaction is also pretty high. But most importantly, 16% of visitors are leaving inspired to make a change to protect the environment, and that is our ultimate goal. Um, so that's really cool. <laughs> These are just a few of the responses to surveys a few weeks after visiting on behaviour change specifically. Reduce my meat intake, trying to use less plastic, seems that we are having some um, impact on conservation action. And it's been super heartening to see this feedback um, because beyond building environmental understanding, we're consciously using te tai to promote language learning to unprompted responses. And so we come full circle to our overall museum mission and it seems we are making some inroads there. It's very pleasing. I'm not going to have much time for what we learned, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to dash through this. We did learn a lot about process and making sure that people from very different backgrounds all understand roles and responsibilities. We learned how important the community is, they're willing to help, they have so much knowledge and a big shout out to everyone that was involved in the show right around the country. Vision, I learned that your vision will be challenged on all fronts, often for budget reasons. Uh, people will say just make it a text and graphic constantly. Uh, but if you can afford one experience, that would be better expressed physically or socially, do it because it makes a difference. Sell it to sponsors, uh, scale it back but still do it. 
Um, the final two, testing, vital at all stages, doesn't have to be expensive, just get your people out on the floor. Uh, this is the most important one for me. We were humbly reminded that our team, internal and external, uh, is our everything. Um, and that a project of this scale and length is so incredibly taxing on them. Uh, t team wellbeing needs to be a success measure, is what I would say. Um, because creativity is hard enough as it is. <laughs> this is how it feels. Leadership is very much about um, having faith in them and empowering them. Um, having some fun helps to relieve the pressure. That's my daughter on that chair waiting for me again. <laughs> there is a wonderful uh, harmony in the fact that Mahitahi, the name of the place where Maui is said to have first arrived, the place that our team visited early in the project and that inspired the exhibition entrance, means <coughs> work as one. Mahi, work, tahi as one. And this is the team that did that with all of our communities right behind them, warming our nest. Full credit to everyone involved. Kia ora tato.